Um, hello, my name is Ainsley Moore and I am privileged to serve as the chair of the Canny Global Board. Welcome to this session um, and welcome to Climate Action Week 2024. This is um, the fifth time we've run this program and I'm really delighted with the breadth and depth of the, um, the sessions that are available, but I'm also particularly pleased that there are opportunities for us to come together and speak and network and, and share our knowledge and um, plan for next steps. Um, Today, um, Anne and Vinod would be leading the um, networking conversation following a session from uh, Petulia on what is the Canny Academic Advisory Board. But before then, what is Canny? Um, founded in 2019, including by um, our illustrious co-founder Petulia, who joins us here today, um, it is a volunteer-led and run association that aims to mobilize the power of international education community to address climate action and how we can transform our own sector to make change. Um, it is volunteer run, there's a global board with representation from across the world, we have regional chapters in Europe, America and Oceania and now I would consider that the academic advisory board is another form of chapter. Um, we do our work through working groups um, which focuses on different aspects of what we're trying to progress. The Climate Action Week um, itself is run through a working group of volunteers uh, contributing to not just the development of the conference but also the content. Um, Kenny has been growing um, and I feel like momentum is starting to peak. Um, more often than not, I don't actually have to introduce Canny any longer. People know what it is, which I feel like is a change in the air and it brings me a great deal of happiness. Partly that is down to the fact that um, Canny has been doing well um, and has been getting recognition in the international education awards space, but also we've been growing our reach. Membership has grown to over um, 750 people around the world. And we've had um, over 65, uh, organizations sign the Canny Accord, which again speaks to the um, extension of our reach. Um, however, if you're not yet a Canny member, please join Canny. It is a, a fabulous community of people working in international education, research and, and teaching in this space. And um, I think it's a great uh, place for you to uh, connect and join. Um, Climate Action Week in particular is the signature event of Kenny. Um, this year we'll be running it once and we do so thanks to the generous support of our sponsors, University of Tasmania and Alethea Global. We have a couple of, um, we have a little video from the University of Tasmania to share. I can't hear anything. <laughs> we can't hear you either, Katie. Hang on. Zoom still getting me in in 2024. Let's try again. There we go. Magic. I feel about sustainability in gender. Passionate but impatient. As fast as we go, we've always got to be going faster. My colleagues are doing remarkable things. And every time we do a radical thing, I know we can do more. Because we have to solve this now. The University of Tasmania has a very clear, holistic sustainability agenda. We have embedded it into our overall strategic plan for the university. It has its own framework for sustainability that encompasses four main areas of activity that are to take into all of our decision making and activities. In protests, we choose always deliver additional environmental and social co benefits, for example, biodiversity protection or the creation of jobs for local communities.
Oh. Our second climate action sponsor this week is Alethea Global. Alethea Global is a worker cooperative and sustainable training consultancy built by members with relevant international education experience and knowledge to support the required transformation for a more equitable, climate conscious and sustainable sector. We are grateful for the support of both Alethea Global and the University of Tasmania in this Climate Action Week. Um, uh, to the, the, the previous point, um, we can only do this work because uh, we are supported by sponsors um, and by the work of the volunteer members of Canada. It's probably grassroots and we want to stay that way, um, but we do have ongoing costs. So if there's potential for you to make a financial contribution or your organization to make a financial contribution to the work of Canada, we are keen to learn. Please click through um, if you are able to um, make that donation or if you are able to learn, interested in learning more about how, um, and also feel free at any point to reach out to um, me or Petulia or other active canning members to discuss how we might collaborate and engage. Um, Again, this is day one of Climate Action Week. There's a whole lot coming. Please feel free to jump onto the uh, events page and have a look at what else is on because um, I'm really quite proud of the diversity of sessions we have this week, the, the uh, breadth of the different sessions and how they address different concerns of people working in international education. So I hope that um, today's session is useful for you, but also that you find some other content of value in the conference week. And now I'd like to hand over to Petulia. Thank you. Thank you, Rakauto, and uh, welcome everyone uh, for our little networking session today. Um, I'm going to be first introducing the whole academic advisory board, um, and then I'll be asking uh, Anne and Vidud uh, to talk about their research and, and research interests, um, and then really most of the time today we'd like to use with you uh, to discuss your research interests and how potentially we could also support and, and provide uh, more opportunities for networking and um, us all working together as well. So um, I'll just show you first um, who else is in um, the academic advisory board. Um, so CANI is a new organization um, and the Academic Advisory Board is a, is a new kind of addition to the CANI, CANI structure as well. So um, this was only um, established last year. So we've been operating for about one year and we're still kind of finding our way of, of being part of the CANI network and how we can best support um, CANI Global Board. Uh, but basically we're an appointed committee um, that helps provide advice and, and guidance uh, for CANI. So obviously all the work of CANI should be evidence-based um, and there are a lot of information needs. So CANI needs information about what's happening in climate science, what's happening in climate mitigation, sustainability reporting, international education and, and so on. So again, uh, our role is uh, when asked to, to provide guidance and advice as well as provide uh, for example, um, help when CANI is developing new, new resources and content as well. Um, and today we have a couple of members uh, present here, uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge our other members in 2024. Um, so in 2024, we have nine uh, people in, in the Academic Advisory Board. Um, and this field is interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary. Um, so we need expertise from people who um, who have uh, a science background, um, such as Professor Hong Yang in the UK. Um, so he's really established in the climate science area. Uh, we need expertise in areas that are related to us, uh, such as Professor Frauke Urban. Hopefully a lot of you were able to attend her, her keynote um, and she's an expert in sustainable aviation. So what's happening in sustainable aviation is going to have a massive impact on us as a sector as well, um, because we are still so highly reliant uh, on people flying from, from A to B as well. 
Um, and then we have people with uh, expertise um, in, for example, organizational sustainability and management, as we know is going to be um, talking about some of those themes today. Um, and, and people who have more of an experience in the intersection of international and education and climate uh, climate change, including obviously uh, Professor Robin Shields. Um, I think that most of you may have heard of some of his research. Um, I'm kind of in that same some bubble, uh, bubble um, as is also Dr. Savo Peleta as well. Um, and then obviously we have um, Anne, who's been doing a really exciting work uh, interviewing international education professionals, um, and Dr. Mukofe Masutha as well. Um, and there's a lot of expertise in education policy um, and climate justice in, in this area uh, also uh, as it comes to Savo's, Savo's work. And then recently we have appointed our first uh, student member, uh, Tin Nguyen, who is also uh, associated with some of the work Anne has published, um, is also part of our um, advisory committee. So um, we have a lot of expertise in different, different fields, um, but we're also trying to make sure that we have a bit more of a global representation, obviously, um, in the academic advisory board as well. Um, but I would now like to first ask um, maybe Anne, you can start, uh, talk a little bit of your uh, research interests um, and maybe some, um, some prior research as well that you have uh, conducted. And after that, we'll uh, hear from Vinod. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Ann Campbell. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm currently uh, traveling in Europe, um, but I'm based in California in the United States. So uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to join you. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I have two slides uh, to share. I just wanted to quickly summarize uh, my previous research, um, but uh, perhaps more interestingly, uh, share with you what I think, uh, what I would like to see on the horizon for research, uh, especially if there are early career researchers here who have uh, mutual interests. I'd, be, I'd like to know that. Uh, so as P. Julia mentioned, uh, I have a team um, that was lucky enough to work with T. Nguyen and Maya Stewart, um, and we were able to um, conduct research uh, during the period of COVID uh, in 2020, looking at how international educators uh, thought about, responded to, um, and were worried about uh, climate change. So here are some high-level findings. Um, and one is a, a chapter uh, in a book that Petulia co-edited um, with Karen McBride, and that's the green icon at the top. And then the other article um, was in um, a special issue of the Journal of Studies of International Education. So um, overall findings, uh, international educators, so those who are work in the field, many of whom I think are, uh, many of us are also consider ourselves international educators, um, see climate change as both a threat to the field and an opportunity. Um, so many of our interviewees mentioned that um, while they're excited to respond to and consider uh, the impacts of climate change, it also does feel like a threat uh, to the field. Um, that international educators feel stuck, um, frustrated, and overwhelmed by climate change um, and its impact. A lot of this um, was due to not having a clear sense of how to measure it, how to respond to it, um, and some of the feelings of climate anxiety. Um, they felt a challenge on how to reconcile these feelings while at the same time promoting um, student mobility, especially those that advise students directly how to uh, answer questions and show concern, but at the same time, uh, try to encourage students to participate in this transformative educational experiences. Um, and they had a call for reimagining the field uh, with less air travel uh, and more virtual exchanges. Um, likewise, uh, international educators um, were taking many actions. Uh, personally, so their daily lives were filled with um, very um, environmentally conscious choices in terms of transit, diet, um, and other activities, um, but they were quite frustrated with the inactions of their organizations or universities um, and the larger field. They felt like they were kind of an island um, within their office or uh, their institution. Um, and what they really called out for were clear guidelines on how to take action. Um, 
they they felt like at this point for many of them that the choices were either to not travel or to not promote international education as opposed to really understanding the nuances and promoting more sustainable uh, international exchange. So the other uh, the other thing I want to highlight um, are some uh, areas that I hope um, that researchers uh, are engaging in or will engage in the future um, at the intersection of international education and climate change research. Um, and I've kind of categorized these into three uh, levels. So the first is uh, research that would benefit individuals, um, especially international educators or those of us working in the field. Um, this would include useful calculators um, for carbon and other um, tools for students, for faculty and third party providers um, to help to make choices in real time. Um, so if if carbon is um, the, the measurement that um, people are following when making sustainable choices and they're trying to reduce um, the amount of carbon or methane uh, going into the atmosphere to really consider um, how to use a calculator to make these choices, both in the planning and then in the real time execution. So uh, once people are already on the road, uh, so to speak, or already the learning has already begun. Um, the second category is research that would benefit universities and third party providers um, or organizations that uh, arrange for um, study abroad and international student exchange. Um, so more examples um, of low carbon um, immersive educational experiences, um, more examples of universities that are um, really working to reduce um, the overall uh, carbon footprint of the institution. And then also support for international students. So um, as I'm, I know all of you know, uh, there is quite um, a, um, there are many different levels and qualities of education globally. And by simply uh, not allowing students to travel uh, to obtain degrees, it's not uh, likely the right answer. So therefore, for those who do uh, gain scholarships, for those that do cross borders, um, four degrees, how do we support um, those initiatives and really try to think about um, encouraging mobility um, with without uh, that large carbon footprint. And then finally, um, research to benefit uh, large organizations. Uh, NAFSA, was, it was mentioned earlier that NAFSA has signed the Kenny Accord, which is wonderful. Um, but uh, the larger questions still remain about how to manifest uh, or promote greater policy pressure um, to reduce carbon um, and kind of think of creative ways to have uh, these large organizations really um, lobby and organize to make a statement. Um, as many of you know, most organizations have returned to in-person conferences. And so this, uh, yeah, this raises, uh, you know, a considerable footprint uh, to have people come together for three or four days. Um, and it's surprising to me that, that these organizations who, uh, seem to be promoting social justice and social change are also encouraging uh, flying, uh, among other uh, other things. And then also um, increase of funding for research or creativity to green international education. Um, there are some competitions and awards and things like this, but I think a lot more could be done to really promote uh, creativity in this space, um, to share examples and to take risks, because we're not, in my opinion, we're not moving fast enough to actually um, address um, international education's impact on climate. So those are just a few a few thoughts to share. Uh, I'll pass it off uh, either back to Pichulia or to Vina. Yes, uh, thank you, Anne. And, and Vino, you, you, can, um, you don't need to have slides, but yeah, if you can share some of your research with us, that's, um, that's great. I'm not very good at, good morning, colleagues. It's 11 o'clock here or something like that, but I'm not very good at talking. So I have a few slides, is that okay? <laughs> I'll just share. Uh, so that you can have some visual entertainment in the meanwhile. Let me see. Uh, all right. Do you see the screen that I'm sharing? I hope you do. Okay, perfect. Um, I just wanted to take a few. I, I have more than two slides. Sorry, but I'll be fast. Not to worry. Um, I, I'm uh, just to introduce myself. Um, my name is Vinod Shashidharan. I'm a, an associate professor. Uh, my discipline is uh, sustainable development and tourism. Um, that's the area. Um, and I also at uh, San Diego State, I'm from San Diego State University in California. Um, and uh, we, uh, I'm also the director of transborder and regional faculty engagement, considering where San Diego is positioned in this transborder region. Uh, we uh, all collaborate with quite a few uh, Mexican institutions south of the border, uh, 10 to 12. 
uh, including faculty and students. So uh, SDSU, uh, I'm just giving you a backdrop here. Um, let me move to the next slide. So, just a few things that I'll, I'll, I'll present to you today, uh, a little bit of an introduction of myself and my research focus, and then uh, some backdrop of my engagement in sustainable development education. Um, and some uh, thoughts for some potential future research uh, from my perspective. Um, now, in order to present my perspective, I'd like to give you a, a bigger uh, context of the institution um, that I'm affiliated with, San Diego State. Uh, we have um, uh, a, a global uh, education strategy. Um, I think you can see the, the circle there. Um, and in a nutshell, the core values of the strategy, of the strategy um, okay, essentially we are looking at comprehensive internationalization uh, throughout the campus, uh, which means uh, not just a, uh, a physical uh, travel to another place, uh, but also integrating international concepts and topics within the curriculum uh, at, at every, at, in, a, in every discipline as much as possible. Um, and uh, courses are encouraged, not just courses, but we encourage um, our, our faculty and students to look at um, a global education uh, along these three lenses, access, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, uh, sustainability, and also for us, transporter engagement um, and comprehensive internationalization is at the center of it. So uh, the quote there is from our president, Adela Del Torre, essentially emphasizing the need for us to educate our students to become more globally responsible, socially responsible, globally conscious, et cetera, um, essentially leading to the idea of global citizenship. Um, as for my background, um, my research work has been in the area of advocating uh, for global citizenship, social responsibility and inclusion and sustainable development, um, both through research and learning and also my professional commitment to uh, innovations in international education. Um, personally, uh, my lifelong goal is to contribute, keep on contributing to sustainable development uh, through my experience, not just through research, but also through impacts on communities. Um, so in both my experience in international and transborder engagement, uh, and also commitment to global education and curriculum internationalization, focusing on sustainable development. I think I've rattled that already to you. Um, in terms of research and teaching, as I think as others have mentioned before, um, most of us are interdisciplinary scholars and researchers, and so am I. Um, and in, in my case, I, I hone into the area of social responsibility and community engagement um, in sustainable development with an emphasis on also the sustainable development goals, SDGs, uh, assessing SDGs. We've done some assessments of SDGs uh, from my field in some uh, in, in several countries, including Slovenia, et cetera, et cetera, Mexico. Uh, Romania. I will, I will share that in a little bit. Um, um, and, and I focus on long-term international collaborations um, from and, and really focusing on community-based outcomes. Uh, that's key. Community-based outcomes, community-based outcomes, community-based outcomes. <laughs> and uh, international engagement partnerships, uh, from my perspective, they have focused on transborder, social justice responsibility, uh, coastal and climate resiliency, um, and also uh, uh, global citizens for sustainable development. Uh, projects that I engage in are community-based, they intentional, uh, problem-based, um, uh, ranges from a variety of issues. But uh, the and and then and and at the same time, I have made it a, an effort to engage uh, our graduate students and our undergraduate students in these initiatives as well. Uh, that creates a nice uh, peer mentoring model. Uh, where faculty uh, from both countries, students from both countries, uh, community members of the other country all working together uh, with clear learning outcomes and makes the students more career ready as well. Uh, some of the pedagogies that I've implemented in my uh, educational initiatives are PAR, uh, service learning. Uh, during COVID, we transitioned to ESL for a little bit. Uh, we published a paper on that. Uh, it's coming out in Frontiers, the uh, International Interdisciplinary Journal of Study Abroad. Um, and then uh, we also have community-based learning, uh, my approach, and also COIL, um, all different formats and, and modalities for international education. Uh, some of my seminars have been uh, global seminars, meaning uh, study abroad programs, PAR, 
uh, has been in Bosnia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, Romania, Slovenia, Turkey. Uh, usually the collaborations are with the universities and community partners, uh, especially NGOs, um, colleagues um, from students, the transport region, uh, long-term partnerships. Uh, we have continued that even through the pandemic. Uh, when our borders shut down, uh, our Zoom uh, calls were on. <laughs> and then we had, um, and, and all of our efforts are really uh, sensitive to access, equity, diversity, inclusion. When I say our, myself, my collaborators. Um, and transborder engagement and sustainability. And this is a final slide. So uh, potential research um, uh, for sustainable development. I've noticed, um, you know, I was, well, I just had a call with uh, Julia, who's on here too in our networking session today. And I was mentioning that um, when we, you know, uh, one of the dilemmas of implementing, for example, the government of Mexico has a sustainability policy. Uh, and they are very hard nosed about those policies being implemented at the local community level, but it does not it does not stick. Uh, so that we need to come up with local grassroots uh, perspectives, especially for those populations who do not have the means or resources to even make the end meet on a day to day basis. Um, so uh, I, I say um, you know we need to address SDGs in local communities. But even further, uh, it is um, the last bullet point is that we need to have faculty engage in research, specifically focusing on the needs of marginalized populations. And for our border region, it becomes extremely vital because we are a population of migrants and mi migration is a big topic in this area. Um, and um, you know, we have new populations introduced into our mix every day, and how are those voices addressed, and how are their quality of life issues addressed? Um, that's it, colleagues. So another thing that I've noticed is our, um, our uh, at, especially at SDSU, um, our uh, URMs, or we call them uh, underrepresented minority students, are very, uh, not very, uh, well, do not have much access to study abroad opportunities for a variety of constraints and reasons. Uh, but they do provide valuable input into our discussion of sustainability, too. So the dilemma is how do we get them engaged, um, you know, uh, get their voices heard as well, as opposed to the, uh, you know, the general national visions and charters, et cetera. Um, they are our future as well. So that's another uh, challenge that I see is engaging underrepresented students in in um, intentional project-based learning abroad. Uh, but that's it, colleagues. So that's my presentation. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank, thank you, Vinod. And, and um, again, you can see that there are different ways of, of looking at this, um, you know, specific area of research that comes from using different lenses and then theories and, and disciplines as well. Um, but now we would really like to hear more from you, why you're here, what's your interest in um, in um, international education and, um, and climate change um, as well. Um, so, um, I might just uh, start from the order you are on my screen, but if you don't want to share, then again, uh, just feel free to, to pass it on the next one. Uh, uh, is it Shana? Shana Sober, could I ask you first to um, introduce yourself quickly and, and share maybe some of your um, areas of interest um, or, or other reasons being here today? Hi, all. Um, I'm Shana Sober. Thank you very much for allowing me to join. Um, I actually work at NAFSA, the Association of International Educators in Washington, D.C., and my work is mainly on the scholarly side. I also am a staff partner to the Teaching, Learning, and Scholarship Knowledge Community, um, so very much connecting bridges between scholarship uh, researchers and practitioners in the field. So, um, yeah, just looking to advance those conversations and help where I can. Yeah, I, I guess you already had, uh, was it from uh, from Anne, you had a couple of things for, for you to consider as well. Um, and obviously, we know that most of the research in this field has uh, maybe other interests than and lenses. So um, it would be great to see if we can somehow contribute to your work to, to further kind of make the sustainability and green lens of, of more interest to um, the research population as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then um, Diana. 
Hello, uh, my name is Diana Wiesecker. Um, I work at the Center for Global Education at Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I, I my major, I, I studied at Gettysburg College also, and I studied environmental studies. And so um, I brought this interest from my from my studies into this uh, this realm of international education, which proved to be like a very beneficial part of my education at Gettysburg. Um, and I have been interested so ever since I started in this role in getting Gettysburg to be a signatory of Canny. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm almost there. I think I just need to gather everything up, but I um, just love all the intersections of international education and sustainability and um, while it's a, it seems like a double-edged sword at times, it's just one that I, uh, I'm, I'm confident there's like benefits and like there are ways to make it, um, as, as cohesive as possible. <laughs> so thank you for, for this week and hopefully the signatory will be coming soon. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, great. And, um, again, I have met others who come from more of an environmental science background and then have moved to a role in international education and kind of bring that passion and interest um, with them. So yeah, that's that's great to hear, yeah. Um, and then um, Julia, um, yeah, so you have a you have a current project. So yeah, you can maybe share a little bit of, of what you've been doing and, and your interest areas with us today as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me and it's nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Julia Rolke. I use she, hers. I am currently in a master's of science program in sustainability here at Lund University, but I am most formerly an international educator in uh, environmental systems and societies. And I'm currently writing my thesis on the intersection of international education and climate education and seeing kind of to what extent international education, more specifically place-based learning in international contexts can equip students with the knowledge and skills to engage in climate action. And I deep in the weeds of my thesis, but I have kind of convergent methodol methodologies in coding syllabi and having interviews and um, some survey research too. So looking forward to talking further with you all. Yeah, great. And um, it is obviously uh, really relevant to the work Kenny is doing. So we'd be happy whenever you have your research completed to see how we can also share some of those findings with, you know, the wider community. So yeah, so um, thank you for being part of the discussion today. Um, and uh, Bernd, uh, did you want to go next or do you still have music music in the background? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I turned the music off. Um, so my name's uh, Bernd Fields. I live in Berlin, Germany. Uh, discovered an interesting connection with Ann Campbell, who's on the call. Uh, she works for my alma, alma mater, Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California. I currently work as the program liaison for the Global Career Center, uh, basically providing um, kind of informal education, activity planning, and other resources to students who come to Berlin from abroad to complete um, internships here. Uh, I also recently started a new uh, a new project for our summer our summer 2024 helping place uh, students uh, at uh, internships in Atlanta, Boston, and New York City uh, for the next couple of months. I am uh, interested in this issue um, where international education and climate change intersect. Well, multiple connections to climate change are of interest to me. Um, I am definitely interested in enhancing the uh, sustainability of the sector. And <clears throat> I guess to, to get a little more specialized, something that I would find interesting um, to learn more about the research is, I, I'm, I'm interested in how, in the intersection between climate change and public health. And so when it comes to international education, an interesting application of that would be um, how all our universities, other educational providers, how are they going to disseminate and provide accurate, up-to-date information to incoming students on the reality of public health challenges in the communities where the, the university is located? And I, I think that's a very timely issue because um, I was on another call just earlier. Um, 
where it was it was it was referenced, for example, that Lyme disease, which is typically something associated with more warmer climates, is now something that's even being found in Canada. And so when you have new students come to your your university to go to school, especially if they're not local to that region, uh, you want them obviously to be safe during their time studying. And if the climate is rapidly changing, then you might have new risk factors that the people in the international education office should apprise their students of. So there, you know, there's 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 just such a a manifold variety of implications of climate change, not just for international education, but across every center. And, and Bern, did you have a bit of a background in, was it environmental science or climate science as well? Yeah. Yeah. My, um, actually, I, 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 I have two master's degrees. One was in international environmental policy um, from Middlebury Institute. The other was actually a program focused on uh, indigenous or traditional knowledge studies. And that program and that body of knowledge I was introduced to, I feel is also very relevant because I think part of the reason we're in this mess is that we became inured of a economic model, namely capitalism, that has a very disassociated relationship with planet Earth and, and imagines that we can indefinitely extract from the Earth without there being any consequences. So I, I'm very intrigued by how indigenous cultures and indigenous peoples and their relationship with the world and their their way of seeing their their relationship within the earth system how that kind of uh how shall i say thoughtfulness and uh consciousness could actually be introduced to or inspire people that are of of a westernized industrial society background like in the industrialized first world as we call it um i, I honestly think that's also a, a, one of the keys or one of the answers to climate change is, is it's changing the way people think about our relationship to the earth where it's not this objectifying model of the earth as something to be endlessly consumed. Um, so that's my academic background. Then I have an undergraduate degree in atmospheric science. So I'm a, a weather geek by training. And because I have that background, I usually have a pretty good sense of just how anomalous any strange weather event is, even if I if it's a part of the world that I've never been, I have a good sense of the, what was the normal climatology. And so when it's anomalous, how anomalous it is. So it's supposed to be 22 Celsius in Berlin on Sunday at the end of March. And it makes me very anxious <laughs> because it not, should not be 22 Celsius at the end of March here. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we, we're seeing this um, this kind of that used to be anomalous be becoming the new normal, I guess. And yeah, it's it's very scary. But yeah, you would have probably enjoyed our discussion yesterday. We had also a public health student um, part of the discussion um, and has an interest in in this field. And and there's definitely been some some research looking at you know how that information about health aspects is being distributed to prospective international students. Yeah, as well. Um, and, and Sarah, did you want to um, share your, yeah. Hi, hey everybody. Hmm. Hi, sorry. I'm, I am, um, I'm have a cold. And so I've been <laughs> video mm -hmm. off and my voice is a little bit, a little bit hoarse, but I'm yeah, happy to introduce myself. Um, Ainsley, it's interesting that you just mentioned that Universidad de Chile is doing interesting study abroad programming. Um, I'm actually based in Santiago, Chile, um, but originally from the U S <laughs> um, yeah. So but strange Chile connection. I just saw that there and I was like, what? <laughs> Universidad de Chile. Um, so yeah, I um, I kind of stumbled upon this um, conference because um, I work at, at a company called Austral Education Group. Um, we're pretty much globally um, globally working now, but um, originally started here in, in Santiago. Um, I, I work as an account manager, but I'm also moving into um, a position as ESG and sustainability lead. So I'm, I'm interested in this area and interested in in looking at how we can um, make our, our operations um, more sustainable. So we actually work with business schools um, on their global immersion programs um, and arrange uh, all of the logistics and, and meetings um, with companies. Um, they can be very, very 
different programs. We work, work with universities um, all around the world, lots of um, business schools in the US, um, UK, Europe, um, but also um, uh, in, in multiple other places around the world. So yeah, I'm really just interested in, in I've, it's been interesting to hear kind of where, where all of you are, are from and, and um, you know, working in and, and this, I, I kind of found this conference um, based on a, on a link that, that one of my colleagues sent me. Um, and yeah, really wanted to hear kind of some, some ideas in the international education sector as I'm sort of learning um, what we can be doing, you know, from a, a uh, you know, Light um, standpoint. I was on the the session um, earlier with uh, Fra Frauke. I, I'm probably mis mispronouncing uh, Frauke Urban from from Sweden. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, thinking about uh, you know carbon offsetting. Um, it's something that we're looking at with an organization um, in in uh, Brazil. At, at you know, we've been offsetting our flights with them, and I'm I'm sort of starting an analysis on whether that's really where we should be concentrating our, um, you know, efforts or if there's, uh, you know, flights are a huge part of, of our business um, and what we do um, as, you know, it, we, we depend on people flying around the world um, to study and, in, in, you know, to do a, a week long trip or a 10 day um, long trip in Singapore or Berlin or um, Chile. So um, it's a massive part of our business, but I'm really looking at ways that um, we can, you know, for lack of a better word, offset um, or, you know, uh, compensate a little bit that part. Um, and I think we do a lot of really, really good work in the, you know, social impact area, you know, educating business leaders um, and, you know, introducing them to uh, especially, you know, startups, really innovative people um, around the world who are, who are doing amazing work, you know, whether it's um, more of a, of a social business or not. So I think um, just looking at, at areas where we can do um, better, you know, for the climate, um, but also other social impact. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for sharing. So um, maybe my question for all of you is, um, you know, a lot of you are practitioners in the field. Are there kind of specific uh, knowledge gaps that you have identified? You know, are there aspects that you you're hoping? Oh, I wish there was a research study looking at this specific question or topic. I really need this information, but it's not available. Um, and obviously highlighted some of those aspects. You know, the the lack of like calculators that we could easily use rather than do a a project that takes us a year. So um, anything that you have maybe noticed um, that you think might be worth uh, worth looking at, uh, we'd love to love to hear from you. And Julia, as well, you may have already identified some other aspects in your in your literature review that we are kind of lacking, lacking as well. So feel feel free to share. I can chime in a little bit. I could go on because I'm very much in the weeds <laughs> at the moment. But you know, I shared a lot of the similar sentiments to Anne or Dr. Campbell, and I think, you know, in speaking with Dr. Shields, also, you know, his kind of seminal study on calculating the real emissions of study abroad hasn't been revisited in a while. And there also hasn't really been um, a quantified number of what the real emissions and impact of study abroad is and are um, for various disciplines. And so I think that's a real research gap that uh, could be explored further of like which institutions, which departments, where students, you know, host versus um, receiving uh, institutions are seeing the most climate impact and which ones are also engaged in the most climate action could be an interesting study. And then beyond that, what returnees are doing in their home countries. And I think from that standpoint, there's a real like social justice kind of foundation there of who is benefiting from these opportunities to travel and have student mobility um, and who is, because, you know, we run the risk of climate action being a, you know, precluding folks who really should be benef benefiting from these experiences. I think we all come into Canny with the same kind of agreement that international education should operate in some capacity and that we want it to act, we want it to operate in a sustainable way. So I think some of the policy endeavors um, that might, you know, be providing sticks or uh, incentives or uh, opportunities for 
either an increase or decrease in internationalizing education, we need to be really wary of the social justice aspect of things. So uh, I could ramble, so I don't, I'm afraid to ramble, um, but I'm really happy to be here and talk with other folks who are super interested and um, committed to this endeavor. And I'm really curious to see kind of where Candy goes in the next five to 10 years and what role we have beyond Canny, right? And like shaping other folks who are getting involved in climate action. Just in like my preliminary research, what I've found is Canny has kind of this permeating aspect to institutions beyond folks who are involved in Canny. And that's really inspiring to hear. So thank you for all of your hard work. And it's affirming to hear the work that is being done on the ground and not just circulating among academics, but actually you know, rolling up your sleeves and getting stuff done. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, obviously, um, there are a lot of no, a lot of knowledge gaps um, still. I mean, there has been quite a few studies on study abroad um, emission footprints as well. Um, for example, a chapter in our book as well and, and other studies. Um, but yeah, we still really lack uh, uh, a way of calculating it in a like a reliable, reliable um, kind of manner uh, to some extent. Um, and so a lot of my recent research has actually been in carbon reporting disclosures, uh, science-based targets. We don't really hear this discussion at all across uh, the international education sector yet. So I'm hoping to maybe take some of those concepts and, and reporting uh, kind of uh, disclosure frameworks and maybe bring it more. So we have a, a bit more of a, a consistent basis to, to think about you know, the different scopes. Um, and I agree with what you're saying about uh, you know, we quite often make these statements, our uh, international education is, it's transformative and, you know, people are going to have good sustainability attitudes and behaviors. Um, and we do have some research, but it's a bit mixed. Um, and we, for example, know that people who traveled for education are likely to travel later in their lives as well. So how do we kind of measure the actual life, uh, you know, life cycle impact, uh, lifetime impact of, of being involved in that? So yeah, great, great. Um, topics. Anything else? And Anna, yeah. you may want to, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I jump in? Yeah, um, I think these are really good points. Um, and uh, last summer, I spent some time looking into the math uh, of as as fights become more efficient and kind of what does it, what is the actual cost of uh, students, you know, going from Beijing to New York uh, to study, etc. Um, and I think one of the things that, or two of the things that I've uh, settled on is that one, I, it it has shifted for me to be a quantitative exercise. Um, before I was much more interested in kind of the ethics and the attitudes, um, but now I am much more concerned about the actual numbers um, and the amount of carbon going out with each flight or uh, each conference. Um, but the other thing too is that I, what I really wish is that um, I, I don't know exactly how you all find your flights, um, but uh, Google Travel allows you to see the emissions um, of your the flights you're looking at alongside the cost, including those that are um, lower in emissions than the, the average flight. And what I really wish uh, is that uh, Google would also just sponsor a little button that says that they'll offset the price. So they'll give you the cheapest flight for the lowest carbon, um, and then they'll cover the difference. Because from the from my understanding, the students I work with, they really do want to do the lowest emission, but saving that $50 or $100 or $300 is paramount. And so as much as we can uh, try to align the lowest carbon with the lowest price, I think uh, is, is the short term answer. Right. Anything else, uh, Shana or Diana or Bernd, that you'd like to share or anything you you kind of, yeah. Yeah, Bernd, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, after you asked that question, I was trying to um, brainstorm about other interesting research gap possibilities. Something I was wondering about is, um, <clears throat> so as the, as, the, as the world warms, obviously, unequally throughout the world, I would think there's going to be a need for a certain type of knowledge exchange between different parts of the world and, and, and the universities located there. Like, for example, if you imagine um, universities in temperate or tropical climates, some of the places that are warming are now going to have some of the problems that you typically had in other parts of the world, like like um, Lyme disease and ticks is but one example. And I wonder if there's any been any sort of framework or model 
that's been created where you could almost kind of create like an exchange program in between. Like sometimes there's a universities will have a sister university where you could do some sort of knowledge exchange so that communities that are going to start to become more like more tropical or warmer climates, maybe there is some sort of knowledge exchange between the students of those universities so that there's, there could be a, yeah, like a knowledge transfer. Um, I think about that a lot, like just, so I, I live in Germany and I grew up in Texas where in the summertime in that part of Texas where I grew up, it can be 40 Celsius for weeks at a time. And I've been in Berlin much of the last two and a half years and there is no air conditioning on the transit system here. And there are other aspects of life in Germany that are not designed around a warm climate. And like a great example is like if you go to Spain and warmer climates, they tend to have a siesta or they tend to have a time of the day where you don't try to be outside, you don't try to be too productive because it's just too hot. And so some of these practices that are more common in warm climates and some of these other issues like pests, these are going to be things now that we're going to start seeing in places that are not accustomed to them. And I, I've thought about that too, like, cause we've had, I guess there's more frequency of tornadoes here now too. Like there's, there's things that happen here now that didn't really ever happen 30, 40 years ago. And I, I can't even imagine that German infrastructure, like out in the countryside, I don't know what percentage of homes in the countryside have basements. So like if there was a tornado, you could like go flee and hide in your basement, but you know, so there's all these there's all these implications, right? And I, I think a, I, I think a knowledge exchange between different parts of the world where they have different practices and different knowledge sets, I think that would be very interesting. Like if someone did some sort of research on that topic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think we uh, we have to kind of uh, wrap up. Um, any anything any final um, insight from uh, Anne or Vinod before we let. Uh, Ainsley and uh, Katie to do the final uh, thank yous. Again, we're we're trying to see how we can uh, we can kind of provide more of these opportunities for uh, for knowledge sharing um, through Kenny as well. So uh, please, um, you know, follow Kenny on on social media so that you know if you have similar sessions in the future, you'll uh, you'll learn from them. And again. Um, if you're looking at research or, or have a kind of a problem you'd want somebody else to look at, um, we'll try to find a way for you to kind of share those um, views as well. Um, thank you on my behalf. And then uh, Katie and, and Ainsley, I'll let you to uh, just uh, wrap up and, and say thank you on behalf of Kenny as well. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you all very much for your contributions to this session. I, it is just approaching 6 a.m. here and I've been awake since 2.30 and I did not feel like sleeping through any of this. It was so engagement. So thank you very much for um, the enthusiasm and the expertise you brought to these conversations. Um, in my heart, I'm a, I'm a policy wonk and an international educator specialist before I am a researcher. But I love that that um, this is a cycle and that the work you do becomes the work that I need to do and very much becomes the work that I would be doing in hopefully collaboration with Shana at NASA. I think there's um, really some opportunities for us to um, take what we, we create, what we know as researchers in our field and amplify that impact across. Um, what we know is a field of students keen for us to make change and people like ourselves working actively in international education keen to affect that change. So my thanks to all of you, my encouragement, you continue to participate in Climate Action Week sessions throughout the remainder of the week, that if you have not yet joined a canny chapter um, or an advisory or an academic advisory board session, please do so. Um, uh, my personal sense is that uh, it is the end in canny that is important, it is the network, it is the coming together. So I appreciate that you've done that today. My thanks. <laughs>